This episode of Tools for the Future is all about business strategy, which is to say corporate strategy. I suppose we should start here. It's my belief that business strategy is in crisis and has been for quite some time. For the most part, I find most business strategy as it's practiced out in the world to be slow and sloppy and ineffective and incredibly expensive. There are many reasons for business strategies failures from the templates and the assumptions that are made to the way that we're taught to use them in business school to the shortcuts that are taken to the faulty expectations around metrics and what data should be tracked at any given time. Most business strategy is inadequate or piecemeal. It's at the very least out of sequence and incomplete with parts of data and processes not fitting with other parts of the process. In short, it's a mess. Just before the pandemic started in early 2020, McKinsey, the renowned consulting company, released a report entitled What Every CEO Needs to Know About Superstar Companies. Because the report focused on the superstar companies, the top 15% of companies worldwide, whether they're private or public, that were really responsible for all the growth and value in the market, they completely de-emphasized the 85% of companies that they termed zombie companies. These are companies that effectively create little value from their activities. They can service their debt, they can make payroll, but they aren't growing, they aren't movers and shakers in the market, they're not part of the superstars that are driving the markets as a whole. In fact, many of them are dying. And this is where the current strategic tools have brought these companies, illuminating no paths to real or differentiating value. It's astounding to me that a company with the prominence of McKinsey can come out with a report that says that 85% of worldwide companies aren't going anywhere or they're dying in the market and not much has been made of it. Now in this report, the metric that they're using is economic profit, a measure of a firm's invested capital multiplied by its return above the cost of capital. In other words, as a shortcut, growth. In the report, they describe that over the past 20 years, the gap between these superstar firms and the medium firms has widened. And this isn't a technology problem, but a tool problem. And it's probably the single biggest, most important, dirty little secret about the business world. Nearly 90% of all the biggest companies in the world create little value, and they don't even realize it. Most retailers are zombie companies. At most, they move money around in different ways and skim a little off the top in order to make a profit or to stay alive. Every company in the world needs to determine whether they're too a zombie, including yours, because it makes you intensely vulnerable to change. And the danger is that with greater transparency and trust and visibilities, these vulnerabilities are going to be screamingly visible to our markets, our competitors, investors, and regulators. All companies should have a conversation about this within their leadership, as well as their middle management, as well as people on the front line. In fact, the people on the front line, whether they're customer service agents or design researchers or salespeople, know better than most other people in the company whether or not they're providing value to customers and whether or not they might be a zombie company. The biggest problem here isn't even just tools, but process how business strategy is taught to companies is deficient and it is failing the majority of companies as outlined by this report. 85 to 90 percent of companies are going nowhere and yet they're using the same business processes that are inadequate and always have been. They're looking at the wrong data, they're putting it through the wrong process, and the result is that they can't get out of this zombie category. In order to fix this problem, we need a new process for business strategy, and we need new tools to step us through it. So let's look at why traditional business strategy tools are so deficient. One of the first reasons that there's too much of strategy is template-based. Business leaders and startups alike download templates off the internet and start to fill them in without any real understanding of what it is that these tools enable. 
These templates reflect old thinking. The biggest question they miss is what drives customer decisions. That's the most important thing that all business strategy relies on, and most of these tools have no place for that question to be asked or answered. Another problem is that they mix internal and external factors within these tools. Operational issues and needs are mixed in with market issues and drivers, and when that happens, the two get confused and strategy gets confused as well. Another critical issue is that all of these templates never stipulate evidence as part of their answers. So business leaders and startups alike download these templates or put them up on a whiteboard and sit in a room with their pals and guess at the answers that they fill into the blanks. A prime example of this is the ever-present SWOT diagram. SWOT, of course, standing for strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats. And it's not that these four categories aren't important to understand for a company, certainly as a part of its strategy, but the way that this simple template is used is so deficient that it can just as easily lead a company astray as it can help them focus on what's most important. In practice, nearly everyone uses a SWOT diagram by drawing these four quadrants or these four categories and crowdsourcing the answers willy-nilly under each category. For most companies, none of these assumptions are ever tested. There's no evidence for any of them. They mix market issues with operational issues, and none of it is validated by research. This is why, in practice, these tools can be dangerous and lead to faulty business strategy and focus on exactly the wrong things for a market or divert attention away from market decisions and issues in favor of operational ones. Another example is the very common positioning template. Again, people will download a blank template like this off the internet and sit with a team of people in, within the company and fill these blanks out willy-nilly by assumption. Essentially, it becomes Mad Libs for corporate strategy. And I kid you not, you just learned how the vast majority of business students and business leaders are taught to use these tools. None of these answers are validated. And of course, these answers on the screen look hilarious, but they're just as valid as what most people put into these templates when they're trying to do business strategy seriously. A third example comes from a very new tool that's been introduced just within the last few years called the Strategic Choice Cascade or the Strategy Cascade. Now, plans aren't bad. In fact, making choices is a good thing. You can't have a plan without making choices. However, the problem with these questions isn't that they're important questions, is that they're focused inward on the company and not on customers or markets. We, our, we, us. Where are the customers? Where are the other stakeholders? Where are the partners in these questions? It's not that these questions are unimportant. It's that this framework easily allows all the other important questions to be ignored just like the other tools that we looked at. Another part of this problem is that there are lots of steps in strategy, and often not only are steps left out or never approached at all, they're often done out of sequence, and the sequence is important here. An additional problem is that most strategy processes and most business strategy in general only considers sources of quantitative data. And while that quant data is incredibly important, it's only half of the story and it's not even the most important half. Qualitative research is just as important, in fact, probably more important than the quantitative data, and it's left out of most people's business strategies altogether, or if it's collected at all, it's only included at the level of product and service development and not at the levels of overall corporate strategy. Too much of corporate strategy relies on guesses instead of actual data and focuses on the wrong kind of data to begin with. This is especially true in startups or in internal projects, but it isn't unheard of at all in large established companies either. Cultures of not invented here, or we already know our business, or the numbers tell us everything we need to know are so prevalent that they drive the use of inadequate tools in the wrong process, missing the wrong data, and missing the wrong steps of the process that would lead them to actually viable strategy. In addition, most strategy is almost completely disconnected from actual business activities. It's usually shelved after a strategic process that is done by the leadership of the company over a few months, 
they have a good time, they develop a three to five year strategy, and then they put it on the shelf and almost no one else in the rest of the company ever sees the strategy. Certainly at the front lines where employees deal with customers, and even when it is communicated to everyone in the company, it's often done so poorly that employees don't know how to act on the information and the business metrics and management processes that govern day-to-day -day activity are never connected to the business strategy at all. Lastly, most strategy is only infrequently considered at all. It's a plan that's done every three to five years at best instead of something that's done continuously day-to-day -day because the tools currently don't allow that to happen. It becomes a model for failure, linear, incomplete, haphazard, not grounded in evidence, how could a business strategy ever be successful if it's only done periodically in a time span of three to five years and it's never integrated into the rest of business activity? Strategy is only successful when it's dealt with and informs day-to-day -day activity. In addition, strategy can be that much more powerful if it can adjust where necessary based on day-to-day -day market concerns and conditions. This is a little bit of a funky diagram that explains the difference between product strategy and product and service development, which is the block on the right, and the corporate strategy development, which is the block on the left. On the right are questions about how to make and deliver the best products or the best value, the best experiences, how best to develop and deliver these offerings, etc. And the steps to do so successfully move from sort of concept and planning to design spec and prototype to production to testing to launch, etc. This is often called the double diamond diagram around design. However, what's almost always missed, especially in the design world, but often in the business world as well, is the third diamond, the triple diamond. This is the connection of business strategy to product and, and service strategy. On the left are the questions about what kind of business should this be in the first place? What should we be offering customers in the market? What kinds of relationships do we want with stakeholders, with customers? How do we define competitors and position against them? How do we provide and earn value in the first place? And while the double diamond describes how we discover parameters for products and services, we define what's important, we develop them correctly, and then we deliver them, there's this third diamond, which is strategy, where we discover what we need to understand from markets and competitors and customers, and then make conscious, focused decisions about what kind of company we need to be, what our best opportunities and positions in the marketplace are, and then how do we set up our company to deliver operationally the kinds of products and services that we need to deliver in order to be successful. This is where corporate strategy and design strategy or product strategy, for that matter, engineering strategy, connect. And it all starts with the intent of the company or the corporate strategy for the company. It's not uncommon for design teams and product development teams to get a product brief. And the first thing that happens when they open up that product brief that came out of a strategic development meeting, for instance, is they look at that product brief and instantly know this isn't what we should be offering. This isn't what our customers want. Why are we building this? Because we know that's not going to be successful in the market. But it's too late to question those decisions because those decisions have already been made in this first diamond, in this corporate strategy development. The best that developers can do at this point is to accept the product strategy or the product brief and work their best to make it as successful as possible even though they know it's probably the wrong thing. It's not uncommon at all, in fact, for designers and engineers and product managers to understand once they get through the design research project exactly why this product or service strategy won't work because they've done the research with customers that should have been done all along in the first diamond, in the corporate strategy development phase because they see firsthand how customers react to those opportunities and they often find better opportunities than were originally described in the project brief. However, it's still too late. This, by the way, is where companies often reframe or in startup culture call it a pivot because they find out needed critical information from customers and markets 
that negate the assumptions made in the original product strategy, yet they find new ones that are better and they attempt to change the project brief as a result. Ideally, that change should go all the way back to the corporate strategy because that's where the change really needs to be made and that's where the context has to be reset for corporate strategy. However, usually these people and processes and divisions aren't connected well enough or the information is one way, not two way. So that reframe or that pivot can never really happen because the leaders of the company don't understand it or never even hear about it. If we could just get that customer and market insight that is done by these people and like design researchers at these phases into the boardroom when corporate strategy is being decided in the first place, it could inform and change the context and assumptions for corporate strategy so that when strategy and project briefs come back down into the product and service development teams, it's the right product strategy to begin with. In summary, there are so many problems with the way traditional strategy has evolved, how it's taught currently in business school, how it's practiced in companies in all industries all around the world, that it's not a simple fix. What we essentially need is a whole new approach to strategy, not further band-aids or further templates that push or pull or slightly evolve some of the problems, but don't fix the overall problem. Okay, enough of what's not working. Let's talk about what needs to be fixed. Here is a new, better model for strategy. It's more complete. At least it asks you to address things outside of traditional strategic processes. You can always ignore them if you like. But all the elements of strategy are here on this page. Think of it as a periodic table of strategy. The first line or sequence is the market sequence. In military terms, this is called situational awareness. It's about context. This is our understanding of the market and specifically of competitors and customers which form those markets. The next line is all about operations or operational strategy. In military parlance, this is operational awareness. We need to know both situational awareness and operational awareness. However, they're separated for a lot of good reasons. If all you did in strategy was to reorient these two lines, these two sequences, and only perform those steps, you're already going to do better strategy. I guarantee it. However, you need to follow these steps in the right sequence. Starting from the left with customers, moving to segments, then competitors, then position, then opportunities, and then offerings, the assumptions and learning from the first module, the output of that module becomes the input to the next module, and so on at every step. Doing them out of order screws up your understanding of the situation, of the context. Missing a step makes for an incomplete understanding as well. Then, once we complete that sequence, offerings, we take the understanding of our best opportunities and position in the market and the most important things that we could offer in the market, we pull that into the very beginning of operational strategy and evaluate those offerings in terms of capabilities, priorities, partnerships needed, business model, then financials, and then teams and employees. This is the correct way to make decisions, to ask questions and answer them, and take data and pull it through all of these processes so that they're all based on the same parts of the understanding of the situation, of capabilities, and priorities. Then, looking at the other elements of this periodic table, we can look at things like trends. Trends are another aspect of the situational awareness, and they impact both the market sequence as well as the operational sequence, but at specific points. So while trend work should always be done in parallel, we have a place where they need to be specifically addressed. They shouldn't be driving decisions in the other modules. They shouldn't drive decisions before they're needed, or else they'll have the wrong kind of influence on strategy. Similarly, all of the stakeholders that can influence strategy or certainly influence corporate activities need to also be understood continuously and interact with decisions within the market sequence and the operational sequence at specific points as well.
all of these elements need to be addressed at some point, even for five or 10 minutes, if that's all that's needed to evaluate whether they have important impact or influence on a particular company or not. But ignoring any one of these factors and ignoring the importance of sequence between modules opens the door for faulty, sloppy business strategy to be done. But it's not enough to have new tools and a new sequence for strategy. Our fundamental understanding of value and how we deliver it needs to change. This is covered in several other videos within this collection, specifically the five kinds of value. Value comes from relationships, which happen within experiences. It's as simple as that. Value is both quantitative and qualitative, and there's at least five kinds of value. And these all impact strategy specifically because they drive customer decisions. For a deeper understanding of this, you can look at the video five kinds of value or the video experience dimensions. But if we're gonna do better strategy, we have to understand customers on all five levels of value not just features and price, but on qualitative levels of emotion, identity, and meaning. This is often called brand in many companies and industries. The first two kinds of values are almost exclusively examined by traditional business tools and people because they're easy to measure in numbers. The last three are fundamentally invisible to these tools, which leads many people in business to believe they either don't exist or they don't need to be paid attention to. Here's the first truth about value. Those companies and people who focus on total value, all five kinds of value, are in a better position to create more of it more often. In business terms, we can use the word premium value because business people understand that premium value is better than generic value. So those companies and people who focus on premium value are in a better position to create premium value more often and more of it. Value is only exchanged in the context of a relationship. So if there's no relationship, there's no value. Or if it's a poor relationship, you can only derive poor value. And these kinds of values are bidirectional and dynamic. They're always changing in real time, which is why strategy needs the ability to change in real time or to reflect these changes as well. And then, of course, relationships and the value within them only occur within the context of experiences. Bad experiences often yield bad relationships and therefore bad value. Good ones mostly lead to good value and great ones lead to awesome value. And there are at least six different dimensions of experience that form the basis of what needs to be researched and designed in order to create these great experiences. So the five kinds of values are baked into this model. And this is why design research is so important and why good design practices are critical. There's more detail about this specifically in the video Experience Dimensions within the collection of Tools for the Future. So if value comes from relationships within experiences, new or better value comes from new relationships within new experiences, which is to say the identification of new opportunities to create these new values, these new relationships, and these new opportunities. New insights about customers and markets and stakeholders identify new opportunities, and many of those come from design or qualitative research using ethnographic techniques married with the more traditional market or quantitative research. Many also come from stakeholder value analysis, another tool that comes from the sustainability world. And many will come from more thorough trends analysis. This also requires new tools like the Waveline, to analyze and illustrate these new opportunities to create value and help focus people on the best opportunities. You can see more about this on the video on wave lines within this collection. Traditional business or market analysis needs to be expanded to stakeholder analysis and more stakeholders need to be considered than is traditional beyond the most common to customers and competitors. This then also becomes the basis for partnership strategy. You can learn more about this in detail in the video stakeholder analysis within the Tools for the Future collection. If we look back at all of these elements, this periodic table of strategy, 
These include all of the elements and each should be queried at least for a few minutes to get a bigger, better understanding of the market and operational context and the opportunities that any organization or venture can identify for better success. Lastly, this can become continuous strategy when it's done more or less in real time. By having this data in a specific structure for strategy, we can more easily make changes and evolve the data set to respond to real time changes in the market and not have to restart the strategy process from scratch every time. This can be done by putting all of the data in a format that evolves easily, where changes can be made while keeping the integrity of the original decisions intact and only evolved as needed. This is just scratching the surface for how strategy needs to evolve and change in order to be more effective for all kinds of organizations. Future videos will expand on each of these topics, but for now, that's the overview of continuous strategy. Thank you.